Disney reporting strong results uh, last night ahead of next week's big launch of Disney Plus. And joining us right now is Jessica Reef uh, Ehrlich, the senior U.S. media and entertainment analyst at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, one of the great media analysts of all time. Thank you. It's true. It's true. It's great to see you. Thanks for So what do we think of this? Because is, is this now a story we were talking about? Is this a story stock at this point? It's all about streaming and how... But Disney that's a story performs. stock because it's all, it's all based... We're now betting on the future. Well, it, it, it will be a hybrid valuation. So there's Disney's basic business, which is generally really strong with amazing brands, incredible IP, really great consumer products. And then there, there are the three streaming services. And one of the surprises in the earnings last night was how much Disney grew ESPN Plus, a million right. subs sequentially. It was a huge surprise. Hulu grew 500,000. So their existing services are doing well, but really it's all about Disney Plus. And so how do you do the math? I mean, for, for so, those analysts and investors out there that are trying to figure out how they're, how they're going to comp, what, they're, what the comps are going to be, and also how they're going to project out. So we, we, we look at underlying fundamental right. earnings, excluding the direct-to-consumer losses. Disney's always traded at a, at a premium, and they deserve it, so 20 to 30 percent to the market, something like that. And then we've done a bull bear scenario where then we value direct-to-consumer and put in some, um, you know, we, we, we assume that there is some cannibalization. Right. So in the 60 to 90 million subs that Disney's projected, management's projected, we have a range for Disney Plus of 11 based on the 60 million, 17 and 26 dollars. But, but I just point out that 90 million subs over five years seems incredibly conservative. Netflix grew their subs in the last five years by over 100 million worldwide at a higher price, and the streaming market really wasn't developed. So Disney historically has been hugely conservative, and our view is that they can exceed these forecasts. Okay, so, but do you believe that Disney is going to ultimately be picking off business from Netflix or that Netflix is going to be picking off business from HBO Max? Because, you know, I was speaking with Reed Hastings actually earlier this week. He, he likes to make it out as if there's no competition and that, that all of us somehow magically, and I disagree with him about this, he knows it, um, are going to buy to three or four or five or seven different services. And I'm not sure that can really be the case. You know, it, it, I, I totally agree with you. There, whether it's th two, three, or four, right. there's, only, there's a certain amount of subscription revenues that consumers will pay directly. Um, and I would liken, you know, I, I think that the incumbents have an issue. You know, there's, there's just going to be an overhang. And the incumbents being... Time well, Warner or AT and T, Time Warner, uh, or the incumbents you know, being or Netflix. Or Netflix. It, it's when you have a, a new entrant. Do so you think it's the compression of Netflix? I mean, this is the big question: Is Netflix going to have to come down, and everybody else going to have to come up? Is that and there's some meeting in the middle in terms of valuation? I think the growth in subs will go to some of the newer services, and Disney has the biggest scale and presence. What Comcast is doing with Peacock, it's an advertising supported service. Right. Why wouldn't you take it? Why wouldn't you take that service? And then you have Discovery where they have incredible, like, niche services. That Food Network Kitchen is right. really impressive. And the ancillary revenue, whether it's e-commerce or kitchen appliances, whatever they do, it's, it's really interesting. So that's kind of a, another type of service. So the 168 price target, how much of that 168 is the DTC, um, domestic and international? And what sort of valuation do you place on that if you think, or if one thinks that Netflix's valuation should come down, and Disney should go up. So what well, for that done, piece of the We've done business. a bull bear, and our downside is close to 120. Our upside can be okay. over $200. So our 168, oh, wow. it, it depends. A lot of it will depend on the performance of Disney Plus, and we we have a range for the three services, um, which I, we just discussed on just Disney Plus alone, um, which will be the bigger driver. That that's where the volatility is. That part of the business, though, presumably is is a riskier part of the business because of the spend required in order to get to that up to 90 million by fiscal 2024. That's right. It, 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 right. And we, so what we've done in our valuation, we've given them a haircut to Netflix's traditional valuation, mm -hmm. which, if they succeed, w would be the opposite. It wouldn't be a discount. It would be a premium. Because there, there's going to be huge growth over the next five years, likely. So if I handed you $10,000 right now to buy any of the stocks in your world, what would you buy? We love, obviously, Disney at this moment in time right. and Comcast. And Comcast, parent and company Comcast. of this network, we should mention. Well, your parent company, um, Comcast assets are very similar to Disney, and the stock has not traded in line. You know, with, Why is it trading at such a discount to it's, Disney? It's the, 
it, it's a mystery to us. It's, it's incredibly well managed, both on the cable side and on the NBCU side. Steve Burke's done a phenomenal job. It's one of the fastest growing media companies. Brian Roberts has, has positioned Comcast so well with, the, with their product, the array of products, and you know, particularly broadband. So it's, it, I, I, I can't answer that question.